We mentioned in the previous clip that the uh, four causes of fetal anomalies are genetic, environmental, both, or what they call multifactorial, and then a category called unknown. And normally when you have a list of things like this, you put unknown at the bottom because it's a small percent and you know you really uh, admit there's a little bit you don't know. The fact is, the single biggest category for causes of anomalies are the unknowns, which is at least half, perhaps more, and all the rest of them are genetic, environmental, or both. Um, with the genetic anomalies, it's much, much, much more likely that there is a uh, problem with a major portion or a whole chromosome rather than just a classical uh, mutation uh, somewhere on the DNA strand. In fact, uh, 15, 10, 15 percent of all anomalies are due to major chromosome aberrations. An extra chromosome, a missing chromosome, a significant translocation, whereas a classical uh, Mendelian point inheritance is just a couple percent. Uh, on the environmental side, which is at least overall about as big as the genetic side, uh, a significant uh, maternal placental uh, infection of various types uh, is our causes, you know, rubella being the biggest, but there's others, like CMV. Uh, maternal disease states of various kinds, uh, drugs, chemicals, toxins, radiation. Um, the multifactorial category <coughs> is uh, the second biggest after the unknown, which means that the cause of the anomaly is probably a combination of both a genetic predisposition as well as an environmental exposure. But without a doubt, the single biggest cause of an anomaly is unknown. In fact, you know, we, we did autopsies on many, many, many babies with anomalies, and not only uh, was the cause unknown in most of the cases, but the findings uh, were practically non-existent. Uh, for stillborns. In other words, when you have a stillborn and you do an autopsy, over half percent of, over half of the time, you'll never find anything. So, let's make another uh, precise definition. An embryo is a structure between week one and week eight. After the eighth week, the developing human is no longer called embryo, it's called a fetus and it's called the fetus up until delivery, approximately 38 weeks. Um, the critical period of development in which exposures to various things uh, is most important, as you might guess, would be in the embryonic period rather than fetal period. Uh, and I have a really nice diagram for you, which I just love. And it shows, if you look at these red zones here, almost all of them are within the embryonic period. Very, very unlikely for, a, for them to extend beyond the eighth week. And as you can see, the central nervous system and heart are the, um, are the earliest times for a critical period of development, whereas th things like extremities and finally, I guess, genitalia is probably you know, the latest. But what does this tell you? It tells you that the critical period of development in which the uh, developing uh, human is most sensitive to um, things which cause anomalies are very, very early, and they're all, almost all entirely within the embryonic period, and the central nervous system and heart are generally the earliest of all with these somatic structures, arms, legs, and that, and so forth, uh, following uh, afterwards. Uh, when you get to the uh, so-called pure genetic causes of anomalies, we said that single gene mutations, which we'll cover in separate chapters and have been covered to a large degree in the genetics chapter, is a small percent. Eighty to ninety percent of genetic causes are karyotypic or major chromosomal type uh, problems. In other words, uh, Almost all babies that are aneuploid uh, are never born. They die in utero. The uh, notorious uh, exception to that rule is trisomy uh, 21, Down syndrome. Uh, some of the Down syndromes don't make it to delivery, but uh, uh, the single most common survivable 
trisomy is 21. Uh, the sec after that, the uh, sex chromosome anomalies, Klerner, Turner, Kleinfelter, which we dealt with, are the uh, second most common. And uh, if there is an entire chromosomal deletion, they are usually lethal, so they never go very far. And uh, a really good idea, uh, and certainly usually much more uh, revealing than autopsies, is to do karyotyping on aborted fetuses. And very, very often you'll find uh, a karyotypic anomalies. Uh, the single gene mutations, as we said, are not nearly as common as the karyotypic abnormalities. In terms of the uh, maternal uh, infections, uh, rubella was by far the most common cause. German measles, having much of the same skin manifestations of rubella or regular measles, uh, but uh, regular measles is uh, in the um, mother, is, which is probably not going to exist because it's a childhood disease, but uh, German measles was associated with a tremendously high uh, percentage of uh, fetal anomalies, such as heart, central nervous system, remember the very early sensitive areas, as well as things like cataracts. And uh, now rubella workup is an important part of uh, prenatal workup, and of course it doesn't really happen much anymore, does it, because of immunizations. So. What was formerly in second place, cytomegalovirus, CMV, is now considered the number one most common fetal infection in which uh, may be associated with the central nervous system uh, uh, and other anomalies. Drugs, chemicals, not surprising. A whole list of common drugs, you know, besides alcohol and tobacco. We know that alcohol and tobacco are... Uh, notoriously damaging to the fetus. But in terms of common drugs, things which you normally would think would not be too bad for humans, in fact, usually very helpful, like warfarin, like ACE uh, inhibitors, anticonvulsants, oral diabetic agents, uh, acne agents, 13 cis retinoic acid. These are things which have been associated with the surprisingly high. Uh, fetal anomalies and therefore they are not used in pregnancy and the the classic example of that was thalidomide in the 50s which was uh, seen to which was a very popular drug and was uh, associated with causing like very 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 major uh, uh, bizarre uh, fetal anomalies and is just not used anymore how do drugs affect fetal development in other words, what are the various teratogen actions? Well, one way uh, drugs affect or can cause uh, teratogen, can be teratogens, is to interfere with proper cell migration during the embryologic development period. They also can interfere or suppress cell proliferation. When you think about it, all these things are possible. In the various interactions that you have, uh, between tissues, like between ectoderm and mesoderm, uh, it can interfere with these signals that are going on between various types of cells or cellular interactions. They can also interfere with cell matrix problems and therefore affect growth without actually interfering with, let's say, the cell itself. And they can also have a significant effect e either way in terms of accelerating or not allowing uh, apoptosis. And therefore, that's another potential and real uh, known action of a teratogen. Also, uh, there may be um, some interference with uh, hormonal and mechanical forces as well. So these are one, two, three, what, six different ways, six different mechanisms of actions of teratogens. And of course, I want to leave you uh, with the fact that it's not a, like, like carcinogens, like toxins, uh, like mutagens. Uh, there is no such thing as something being a teratogen versus a non-teratogen. Almost any compound in a high enough dosage can have a teratogen effect. So this is all dose-related. And I don't want you to go on thinking that only certain drugs are teratogens and others aren't. The fact is, and as you know, in pregnancy, the general rule is 
not to take any drugs unless you really have to. So this is really all a dose-related phenomenon too, isn't it? Uh, okay, we'll call it a quits for now and go on to the next uh, clip very soon. Thank you very much.